miners discovered this 8,000 pound crystal in Arkansas. It was donated to the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, which has one of the largest mineral collections in the world. We knew we had something very special. But donations like this don't happen often anymore. That's because crystals are getting expensive, really expensive. Even millions of dollars for a single specimen. Things that were 50 to 100,000 back in the 90s could easily be half a million to a million and a half today. But because crystals formed millions of years ago, there's a limited amount of them. What we dig up is what we got. Take the scarcity, growing demand, and that Instagram aesthetic. They're extraordinary because the uncut ones are just beautiful in their rawness. And now you have private collectors scooping up crystals at skyrocketing prices. Our business has been going up at a, a fever pitch pace over the last two decades. It's all making it harder for museums to get a hold of and preserve specimens like this. So how did the industry get so big? And how did the Smithsonian land such a rare piece? To find out, we followed the journey of this giant Arkansas quartz. Whenever you find a big one, you only find just a little bit at a time. That's Josh, a fifth generation miner. He and his grandpa found the Arkansas quartz in the summer of 2016. Most crystals have two sides, forming a pocket in the middle. And the back of it's just flat. So when you're following that ledge, they're growing toward each other. Their points are basically intertwined. So when we're digging them, we didn't know what it was until we brought it up and sprayed it off. First, they removed only one side of the crystal. When we pulled it out of the ground, there was so much mud on it that it didn't even look like a crystal. My grandpa was disappointed. He said, it's just blank. And what we mean by blank is it's just quartz and there are no points on it. And that was kind of discouraging. So we put it on the truck and drove it up here to the cleaning shed and started spraying it off. And we are just like, oh my God, like, this is phenomenal. You know, it was way more than what we expected it to be. And we actually left the other rock still sitting in the ground and went back about an hour later and got that piece. Altogether, it took them about two months to unearth the giant crystal. That's the biggest one I've found, yeah. The Arkansas quartz weighs as much as this forklift. The Coleman's knew they had to eventually sell a crystal of this size. And the best place to do that is Tucson. Tucson is the world's largest gym show. Every year, 4,000 vendors descend upon the city. It's estimated that altogether, $5 billion worth of crystals are sold at the show in just three weeks. So we actually took both pieces to Tucson. The smaller piece, which is the top piece, never come out of the box. The bigger piece, which is the bottom one, we actually had to dismantle our whole store place in Tucson just to be able to get it in there. That's where the donors found it. I'm always looking for stuff for the Smithsonian, but probably most of what I find, they go, we already have that. We already have that. I knew right away from the size of crystal, it looked like about eight feet by 10 feet. You can get a bunch of mineral crystals and glue them together, but to pull up a solid piece like a wall like this, that is rare. So real estate developers, Michael and Patricia, called up the Smithsonian. They said, we would love it, but it's not something that we can afford. Because it's a government funded museum, the Smithsonian can't use federal money to acquire specimens. So the world's largest national history museum relies heavily on donors like the Burns to expand its collection. At that time, it was something that we couldn't afford either. <laughs> I started negotiations with the miner. It took me a few months. The Burns wouldn't tell us how much they spent on the crystal, but Josh told us they had crystals this size appraised for $4 million and $7 million in the past. What we got out of it was um, basically that we're keeping an American treasure for the American public. But moving it a thousand miles wasn't an easy task. They're fragile. With that particular piece, half of it was big pointed and the other half was little bitty points. And those little bitty points, they'll come off real easy. They suspended the pieces with straps and forklifts and then moved them into two wooden boxes. We have big 55 gallon drain trash bags full of just wadded up newspaper and it does a great job. <laughs> Josh and his family drove those boxes halfway across the country to D.C. Although we bring a lot of specimens into our collection every year, almost never do they come in a big truck like this. 
So this is a special occasion for us. That's Jeff. He runs the gem and mineral collection at the museum. He makes sure the pieces are in good shape before the museum takes ownership. Yeah, we're just looking for anything that's kind of gotten loosened up. I mean, everything looks like it's been packed okay. well. Look at this. Wow, is that nice? We have at least a couple different generations of growth. It's kind of fun to explore it because you just you see different things. I don't see anything that's been damaged. And this is Charles. He's in charge of moving the crystals. And he's been doing it here since 1995. So this crate uh, contains the first of the two Arkansas quartz. This one uh, is the larger of the two, uh, approximately weight of 5,000 pounds. And there's a smaller crate that has the second specimen, and it weighs 3,000 pounds. We're going to unload and install in the museum today. Just ready to get it moved, get the job done. It takes a team of five riggers, steel plates, and lots of straps to safely move the crystal. How much work does it take to coordinate all these people and all? I don't want to talk about that. Safety is a is an important factor when you're moving stuff like this. I've been doing this a while, so I am perspiring a little bit, but I'm good. The display is only 400 feet away from the loading dock, but it took seven hours. Finally, by midnight, the quartz crystal is secured in place. We're thrilled that it's in there. Not everybody gets in the Smithsonian, you know? So for it to go in there is kind of like a confirmation to me that, you know, we're the best. <laughs> but in the gem and mineral department, getting donations like this is becoming rarer because of the growing and lucrative business of crystals. The fascination with crystals has been there since antiquity. Ancient Egyptians buried their dead with quartz and used crystal and jewelry and even eyeshadow. In China, jade was believed to grant immortality and was built into burial sites for the royal families during the Han Dynasty. And then the Greeks take it up and had medicinal purposes or could ward off the evil eye or things like that. It's that spiritual connection to crystals that made them perfect for the self-care world. And it sort of transitioned in the mid-90s with both the metaphysical boom that started in the 80s and a new group of collectors who were coming on the scene and they were strictly looking at them from their beauty factor. It checks so many boxes in that way, right? It can be a spiritual practice, it can also be for wellness. And then you can capture that in media, right? In Instagram and Goop. Katy Perry, Kylie Jenner, and Gwyneth Paltrow have praised crystals for years. Adele swears by hers for helping with performance anxiety. Today, the industry's worth over a billion dollars. Mines like the Coleman's have become a tourist attraction. So you can come out, dig for your own crystals. You can, we've got a zip line that goes over the crystal mine and we do tours of the mine and our, over the past two years, those have just took off. And big beauty brands have gotten into the game interior design, people buy them and set them around their houses. In New York City, Crystal Healings for Chakra Realignment sell for $250 for a single hour and a half session. Crystal Healing operates on the vibrations of your body and, you know, taking any out of balance vibrations and raising them to be at their natural state. Different crystals supposedly offer different types of healing, but there's no scientific evidence to support crystals' healing power. A 1997 study from a Goldsmiths University of London professor found that crystals' power came from nothing more than placebo. Still, that hasn't stopped consumers from scooping them up. It's just now it can be commodified, put in social media, Instagram. All this popularity has made the competition for crystals incredibly steep. Science people are still into it, you have the metaphysical interest that's driving it, and you have the art crowd. Through that growth, you have appreciation and value. Daniel said he's seen crystals sell for 100 times what they did 20 or 30 years ago. Many of the mineral specimens that you see on in these cases and on display sell in the market these days for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars for a single specimen. And so the art world and the mineral world have actually sort of become a very similar kind of an economy. It's difficult for publicly funded museums to get access to great material. And that's because the private collectors today are so fiercely competitive and have such access to money that they're buying um, all, or not all, but a majority of the great objects that are out there. I have no problem with people collecting these things, but the difference is once they're here, they're forever in the public domain. 
which means that we can put them on an exhibit for people to see them. Plus, it provides access to scientists, so it's not just a private collector looking at it in his room or basement or her basement or whatever. And what makes this Arkansas quartz so worth preserving is its rarity, both in size and existence, because there are only a limited number of crystals in the Earth. The crystals formed probably 300 million years ago. Deep in the Earth's crust, and they need the perfect conditions. Crystals can form either from magma cooling down slowly in watery, silica-rich environments or under intense temperatures and pressure. But all crystals need an open space to grow. And then as they move up it, through erosion and through um, outcropping on the Earth's surface, we're able to then find them. Somewhere deep in the Earth right now, probably 10 kilometers down, that we'll never see in our lifetimes or probably in another 50 lifetimes, there are minerals forming, but they'll never, they'll never be available to us. But none of that seems to be slowing down the industry. I think the demand is just going to continue to, you know, increase.